So the next speaker is Jeff Siebert um, from Twitter. And uh, Jeff's um, uh, working at Twitter now uh, on their, uh, some of their mobile technology. So he's going to come up and talk kind of the future of mobile development and process around mobile development. So awesome. Thank you, guys. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. So I'm Jeff Seibert. I'm a director of engineering at Twitter. Um, and so who here has used one of our mobile apps? I assume most people. Excellent. Awesome. So I thought it would be poor form if I didn't actually encourage everyone to tweet during this talk, being from Twitter. Um, so please feel free to do so. The hashtag of here is, of course, EclipseCon. And I'm actually new to Twitter. So as of two months ago, I was actually the CEO of Crashlytics, which is a local Boston startup in the crash analysis space. And we, actually, we started off on iOS, and we are building an SDK to detect if your app crashes. Uh, and so it makes it really, really easy, hopefully painless, put it in, it doesn't impact performance whatsoever, and when your app crashes, wakes up and tells you about it in real time, tells you what line of code you need to fix. Over the past two years, we've been absolutely honored to be able to work with many of the top apps in the store today. Um, and so this has been really fascinating for us because it allows us to see, sort of at a high level, how the market builds apps. And that's what I wanted to focus on. And so the future of mobile. All right, well, that's lofty. That's a, li a little bit vague. And so when I'm put in situations like this, let's actually make it a bit more concrete. Let's talk about what are the biggest problems with mobile development today. Um, what is holding it back from being truly massively successful? Not that it isn't so successful already, but let's envision a world in which this impediment, whatever it might be, no longer exists. And how do we get there? So you've probably seen this. This is classic agile development ever since 2001, the Agile Manifesto. This has been really perfected, I'd argue, by the web industry, by web development in general. Um, and it's very widely used, this classic just design and then build and then test and then evaluate over and over and over again to perfect your product. If you look at Imview, co-founded by Eric Ries, of course famous for the lean startup movement, they have taken this to the extreme. They do it incredibly well. They deploy 50 times a day using this process completely automated. And so what are some of the benefits of doing it this way? Well, most importantly, you never ship stale code. You're not in a situation where you push something, there's a problem, and all of a sudden you have to sort of reacquaint yourself with code you wrote a month or two months or half a year ago to figure out what went wrong. You write the code and it gets out the door. There's never a, a large risk of a deploy going bad because the changes are incremental or small. And so if there's a problem, it's really easy to track down. And then one of the biggest, this really strongly encourages automation. I don't know anyone who gets up for work each day and is excited to do the same thing 50 times that day just to get code out the door. And so this, I think, is actually one of the biggest factors of why this is a fantastic movement. And finally, it encourages experimentation. Companies are always trying to iterate and improve, and the more rapidly they can do that, the better. Um, and so this is a great way to do this. And then you look at the mobile side. And then we get stuck with this. And so five days, are you kidding me, between when I submit the app and it might be released, all of a sudden this changes everything. Envy is able to deploy 250 times before I can ship an app. And that's if I submit every five days. And then you say, OK, well, no, we're more focused on Android. Yes, I totally agree. And Android has it a lot better in this regard. But what we're seeing as a market as a whole is that companies don't want to have different release schedules for their Android and iOS apps. So we're stuck being gated by what the slowest platform is in order to release code. And so even though it's a different platform, it's still deeply impacted by Apple's actions. And so if we have to look and say, OK, well, we need to wait and get this approved. And it might take five days, so we don't want to screw that up. And if a bug gets in, that's an even bigger problem. So we might as well, we need to spend a lot of time testing this. And well, if we're going to spend time testing this, we might as well build a lot, because I don't want to test every commit just to submit it for five days. So let's commit some good time to build. And well, if we're going to build stuff, and it's a lot of stuff, well, we should probably design that and figure out what it's going to look like so we don't build the wrong thing, so we don't slow down our process. And all of a sudden, we have all of this code, to, uh, all of these features to design. Well, we better start planning, like, what is that going to look like? And before you know it, what you've just invented is waterfall. And so now, in mobile development today, you're basically back to this waterfall pattern that's been used for 30 years that really has none of the advantages. And so what does this look like in an actual development process? Well, let's commit some time to sort of planning and design. Maybe we want to save a lot of time for feature development. That's where all the great work comes in. And then you probably have some small teams or individuals working on different things. So now you need to save time for merge. 
So everything's going to merge into trunk, and you want to filter out some bugs there. And then you're going to really want to test this, because you submit, and now it's just like, fingers crossed. I hope this works out. What do I do now? And so we go back to all these advantages we were hoping for. And well, all right, now my code's at least a month old, probably longer. There's actually a pretty big deploy risk. That's why we had to spend so much time testing, because of all this code. This definitely does not encourage automation. We're only doing this once a month. And so countless companies we work for have big QA teams that do all this testing. And your exec team is going to come to you and be like, wait, I can only run one experiment a month because you're only getting one release out per month? This is an absolute disaster. And so I would argue that this is one of the biggest problems facing mobile development today. So how do we make mobile more agile? Well, first, let's put this on a schedule. So all right, here are our weeks. Um, we're going to commit two to feature development. And then at the end, we have this sort of critical path, and we submit to the store, and we get our release, 1.5 out the door. And the great thing here is we can probably overlay a little bit. So maybe we can do some planning while we're testing the last release, and then start coding when we submit it. So OK, this is good. Now we can sort of pack it into more of a month and have a release every four weeks. And then, of course, we can do that going forward. And so, but now what we've done is we, we still haven't solved this problem really at all. We're still deploying 1,000 times slower than MVU is. And we actually haven't really addressed the last step. Like, where are we maintaining? Where are we patching? Where are we figuring out what's going on here? So it, sh it needs to be even slower than this. And so instead, what you do is you release it, and then you wait, and some reports trickle in. And you get some customer feedback, and you try to figure out where the issues are. And maybe you're reading App Store reviews, which a couple of our customers are, which blew our mind, to try to figure out their bugs. And now you're going to slowly work some changes into your release, just in time for the next one. But no, let's like actually fix this. And so this is where my co-founder and I were two years ago. This was the state of mobile two years ago. And we're like, all right, what problem can we tackle here that would make a large difference to thousands of app developers, millions of app developers worldwide? And so we wanted to first start off by, let's tackle this patching problem. How do we make it easy so that you can immediately fix bugs in release under the assumption that a lot of independent apps, a lot of indie developers don't have the resources and time to do QA anyway? So if that's being diminished, they're going to push most of that post-release. They're going to wait for their customers to test their app in production. And their challenge now is, how can we ship this fix as quickly as possible? And so let's imagine we had better data. Let's imagine we had something like this. And so I don't want to, I didn't show a screenshot of Crashlytics here intentionally, because I don't want it to be about that. I want it to be about the data. There's now a couple of tools that do the same thing. But what if, immediately post-release, you had absolute information on the exact number of crashes, the exact line of code they were in your app, and ranked in priority order on how you should fix it. And so what if that existed? Well, if we go back to our developer process, we can actually sort of lay this in now in a far better manner. And let's put in a patching section. So now you ship the code. And immediately, data starts flowing in. So you can actually dedicate maybe one resource, one engineer, for a week to fix the top bugs from that release and submit again. And with just one tool added to your repertoire, you've now basically doubled your release velocity. And you've cut in half the time that your users are waiting for these critical bug fixes. And so that's pretty cool. I think we can also do a lot better, though. So if we look back at our process, we, we're dedicating a huge chunk of it to not feature development. I'm going to argue here that probably the biggest value add to your customers is this feature development block. And so we want to maximize that through our entire process. But here we have a week dedicated to merge, a week dedicated to testing. The week of hope you probably can't do too much about. Um, but what can we do about those two sections? And so let's look at that first. So the key is, before we say, like, oh, well, let's just remove all testing, let's actually define what testing is. I think we need a better understanding of what we're doing here and why it's useful. And so in my mind, there are two cases, one of which, very obvious, everyone's super familiar with. So here are your classic test cases. And these give you a bunch of good advantages. So you, have, you need to check your edge cases. Maybe they prevent 
regressions, and also environment variants. So if you're testing on multiple different devices, you can write test cases, even manual test scripts, if you're still doing a QA team, to verify these and verify that your product works across the range of devices you're going to deploy to. But there's a whole other side. There's a, lot of more, there's a lot more things you need to verify before you should be willing to su submit to this process. And so those, I would argue, are the more intuitive, uh, the softer items. So usability. Does what I just designed and built actually make sense? Is it intuitive for the user? Does it actually meet their expectations? And so I, I was talking with a friend of mine at Square. They had spend a lot of time focused on these aspects. They do the test cases, but they want to care and they need to care that the app is exceptionally easy to use. And so where do you fit this time in this schedule? And so in Twitter, we call this dog fooding. And so ideally, we want to take a build of the app that's stable and send it out to everyone in the company so that they can experiment and see what's going on, give their feedback, and obviously also report bugs if they encounter any. Well, dog fooding, you can't really automate or quicken up or anything. So you need to allocate time for that. The great thing about test cases is you can certainly automate them. And so where do we fit dog fooding in this schedule? Well, once everything's come together, once it's all merged into master, that's the perfect time to sort of cut a preliminary branch and say, OK, this is what we think we're going to ship. How does it look? And so we can fit dog fooding in here. But this, doesn't, this still hasn't really sped up our process or saved us a ton of time. This is sort of another step we layer on just to give us better feedback in the testing stage. So I think we can push a little further. And so if we look at automated testing, on the Apple side, people would argue, oh, it's relatively straightforward. If you focus on their currently released devices, OK, I can test those manually. What I love, though, is that if you look on the Android side, as you all know, that's certainly not the case. And so th huge thanks to Animoca for uh, publishing this image in Creative Commons. This is less than half of the devices they test with for every release. And at the moment, they're doing that manually. And that is a disaster. And so what I love about this, and actually I think this fragmentation is a huge boon to the ecosystem, because it is forcing automation. Nobody wants to go and test with all these things manually. So I think actually even the iOS development world is being helped here, because the second your Android team automates all their testing, then that flows through the rest of your organization. And so on the Android front, what do you do? Well, fortunately, there are a few tools that work. Um, the default tools, there's Robotium that a lot of people use. Square actually just launched a tool called Spoon, um, which I'd encourage you to check out. It basically makes running tests on real devices much easier and integrates all the results into a single UI dashboard so they can understand what's going on. Um, but I'd also argue that none of these tools are perfect. None of them fill the entire problem. And so this is definitely an open area for innovation and would love to see um, back to the prior talk, would love to see more open source contributions here. And I think there's a ton of potential we have in order to really fully automate the test cycle on Android and on iOS, for that matter. And so if we were to do that, what benefits would that give us? Well, ideally, we can actually remove the testing segment entirely from our roadmap. And maybe we're continually building features actually on master, if that's possible, and submitting them with tests. So we don't need to merge because we're basically testing our code on master as we develop. Everyone's iterating and building off the latest check-ins from that day. But we still need the whole dog food process. This really didn't solve that at all. And so what we've done here is we've actually lengthened the, sort of the core feature development flow. So I'm hoping that we can get actually more features into each release. And the benefit is this gives us more opportunities to dog food it internally. And so we can actually have two different cycles here. Um, two different builds, so run the dog food, take some feedback, uh, fix those issues hopefully, and then send it out again before we actually ship it to the world. And so this is something we can drive towards a vastly more streamlined and hopefully vastly higher quality release. And the great thing is this doesn't prevent you from, of course, layering on the different releases. And so you see actually here, because of the lack of a test step, we've cut out the work on the engineering side. So yes, we're doing planning. But that's the only thing overlaid with sort of our waiting for approval process in the App Store. And so you probably have some engineering resources that are available. And what I'd argue here is this is the amazing time. This is classic time for maybe fixing up some things that just didn't go as planned from before, but also doing experimentation, like help with planning. How could we build these things? What would make them exceptionally awesome for this next release? 
because you've sort of now fit free time on the schedule simply by automating your testing repeatedly. And bringing this back to Twitter for a moment, what might this look like at scale? So let's imagine a world where instead of having, maybe you have an Android engineering team, you have an iOS engineering team, maybe you have another uh, Windows engineering team. Instead of having just those, which I think most companies do, and we certainly did as a startup, imagine a world where you have dozens or hundreds of mobile engineers. And so you have core teams for each platform, but you also have people all across the country submitting code in. And so now, actually, your release can't, shouldn't be gated by how much you can build in that given period. So the argument, if I go back for a second, I would argue that this is probably the fastest a small company can put out a quality release, because you're de going to dedicate your entire engineering team for three weeks to build out some great features and then ship it off. But if you don't have to do that, if you don't have to gate your release on the resources of the core platform team, then it actually opens the door far broader. So at scale, what if we decided, well, we want to ship every two weeks and have a train, and the train leaves on time, and whatever gets in, gets in for that release. And so we have our core platform teams that have a week to two to build out some infrastructure on the app side for the rest of the company to leverage overall. And then we have teams all across the, com the company bringing in their features. And so as long as they get in before the dog food build, then their stuff will send out to the entire company. And so these can be long-term projects. This could be, if it's a big R&D group, a month of work or more. It doesn't matter how long it's taking them to build it. All that matters is that they actually merge into master before dog food so that then everyone in the company sees the work. It has ample time to bake and settle and merge with all the rest of the code before you ship it out. And so you can repeat this going forward. So there can be lots of different projects coming in over the course of time. And it allows you to actually have a very rapid release cycle while still having large features in each release, because you're farming out to different teams across the company for those features for each release. And so to wrap up, I wanted to just talk briefly um, and give you guys a sneak peek. So Crosslytics focused on Android for the beginning of its future. Um, I'm very excited to announce today that we have been building out Crashlytics for Android over the past year. And we think we finally have something that we're very proud of and want to talk more broadly about. And so we actually are going to do a private beta for EclipseCon. Um, we've been testing this with a few uh, private partners, but we want to broaden it out. And so if you guys are interested, would love to get your feedback um, and get you guys involved. Uh, please just actually snap a photo of your badge um, so we know you are here and email it to EclipseCon at Crashlytics.com. And so we'll get you in over the next few weeks as we roll this out. Um, but we're super excited to broaden this and get your feedback. And then also, if you're curious in some of the background on how we built this, uh, Mark Richards from Crashlytics is giving a talk at 3 today in Federal, I believe, um, on some of the tools we used and how that came together. So awesome. Thank you, guys. This was fantastic. <laughs>